And we are live. Welcome, readers and book fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeBello, and I'm so excited to welcome tonight author and professor Piper Hugley here to give us the inside scoop on her new book, which I'm trying not to get to hyperexposed there on my ring light, <laughs> by her own design, the untold story of the incredible real-life fashion designer, Anne Lowe. Piper, welcome to Mystery and Thriller Ravens. Tell us about this book. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. I really, really appreciate uh, being here today. Um, By Her Own Design is a book. Uh, it's a historical fiction novel about the life of Anne Lowe, who is most famously known as the woman who designed Jacqueline Bouvier's wedding gown when she married John F. Kennedy in more coronation than wedding in 1953. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes. And so... Uh, M unknown, uh, mysteriously enough, I guess, to fit in with your show, uh, that um, she was not known or has not been recognized fully as who she was, a haute couture designer to the social elite uh, here in the United States uh, in the, well, 30s to the 40s to the 50s and to the 60s. Well, there is a lot to chat about tonight because Anne Lowe is a fascinating character and, uh, and we have a lot to get into. So um, first, I just want to, and we're going to get to every single tasty bit of it, but first, I just want to welcome everyone. So we are going live to many destinations across Facebook and YouTube. So no matter where you're watching from, you are in the right place. This is the right time. And this is a bit of a different book for us because the mystery takes a smaller seat here. But the story of this woman just captured me and the idea that she has um, the time's dust has covered her over and that a Professor Piper has unearthed her and is revealing her to audiences, you know, a hundred years, more than a hundred years after her birth. Um, and, 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 and that we can get to get to know this fascinating real life woman was just too good to pass up. So as always, um, we will be getting to all your questions. So just go ahead and type them in the, in the comments and I'll get them right over to uh, to Piper. Barbara, welcome to the conversation. She says, good Hello. evening. This is Hi. Barbara watching from Michigan. Hi, Barbara. Thanks for joining us. Let us know if you have any questions for Piper. Um, and while you're all thinking of those, I'm going to I'm going to uh, kick off with a few myself. So Piper, let's talk first about um, some of the amazing praise that this book has earned. So we're going to kick off with Kaya Alderson, who is the author of the book Sisters in Arms. And I'm going to pop it up so we can all read it here together. Um, she says, I could feel the love with which Piper Hugley created this tale about the life of Anne Cole Lowe, yet another hidden figure in American history. Hugley expertly morphs each one of Lowe's heartbreaks into triumph and hope. So first of all, congratulations on that amazing praise. Um, your love for Anne Lowe is clear and writ large. Tell us how you came to learn about Anne Lowe. How did you discover her? Well, I've always been a uh, Kennedy fan, uh, you know, and so it's just uh, by me, you know, being very interested in history, wanting to know uh, any of the Black people that the Kennedys had affiliation with. Um, so I always knew about her uh, in the back of my mind. Uh, but strangely enough, it was when uh, I was just hanging out on Twitter back in 2018 when my editor tweeted, uh, would somebody write me a novel about this? And she tweeted out a, a uh, link to an article about Anne Lowe. And so I looked at the article and I looked at some of the other things on the internet and I said, ah, yes, this is a novel that I can write about. And so just like pretty much right away, I wrote what became uh, much of the prologue uh, to the book. And I sent them to my agent and said, uh, tell Tessa I am on this and do not let anybody else know. <laughs> it's <for> me. <laughs> yes, it is me. I will be the one who will do this. So, Oh my um, gosh. Yeah. I love that. Debbie, welcome. She Hi. says, she's from Connecticut. I read this book over the past weekend. Yay. Awesome. Yay. Thank you, Debbie, for giving me a chance. Let us know what you thought about the book. Um, 
what 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 surprised you what did you what was your favorite parts let us know what your what your experience was so piper you had you said that you had always been a fan of the kennedys what attracted you to them is it just the glamour the mystique american royalty the the fact that they are so troubled by tragedy yes all of that all of that i just i love family sagas i love mess anything where there's like a family involved and they're ongoing struggles and uh yeah all of that and of course with with jackie you know fashion um as well in terms of that and i grew up in a house with uh two close horse parents and my mother uh was sewed (laughs) my father was like one of the most dapper men uh in our city so uh, i was their nerdy little daughter they probably wonder where i came from (laughs) But I still like looking at, you know, the the things and uh, thinking about what fashion does um, in terms of making a a statement, an expression of someone's individuality. And of course, in terms of the case of Anne Lowe and various fashion designers, in terms of thinking about the construction of what it is that they do and thinking of it as artistic creation, which always appealed uh, to me as well. So uh, it all, it, you know, when I looked at her her life story and I looked at the things that she was doing in terms of um, creating these designs, sort of her accomplishment of creating bespoke custom designs, never repeating them, um, and the way that she would construct a garment uh, in order to make sure that there were no lines you know, that uh, the the garment fit in a certain kind of way, uh, et cetera. I knew that I had to to write about her as an artist. So I also grew up learning to sew. So I I learned to sew when I was five years old and I learned on a treadle machine, which for those watching Mm -hmm. is the one with the with the pedal under mm-hmm. it so it's not electric you you push the pedal with your feet and that's what propels the 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 needle into the fabric so well first i learned on a knee pedal then i learned on a treadle wow. and <laughs> my mother sewed her own wedding dress so we mm-hmm. she was a very big seamstress and mm-hmm. and my three out of four of my grandparents were tailors so this is oh wow yeah okay a story really resonated with me as someone who still I sew my own curtains my own pillow covers my own Halloween costumes I love to sew and I have my grandmother's 1965 singer sewing machines so okay very, okay very okay. proud okay. um so one thing that I loved about the story was the generational inheritance of this gift of of sewing yes. um mm-hmm. Anne's um, grandmother, who was a formerly enslaved person and the seamstress for the family um, that that she was in, enslaved by, then her grandfather actually secured his bride to be's freedom. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, but the but the family asked if she could stay close by so she could keep creating her incredible creation because she was the best seamstress in Alabama. She taught her daughter to sew. And then her daughter taught taught Anne Lowe to sew. So it was this generational, three generations of the of the three most talented seamstresses in Alabama. But Piper's sister didn't get that gift. Um, she would baste the things together, which is the long the long stitches that later come out to hold the piece of right. fabric together. But she didn't have that gift that that little Piper had, even when she was five, sewing those little silk flowers together. Oh, you mean Anne Lowe? I'm sorry. Anne yes. Lowe, Lowe. yes. So her, because Piper, I tried to make baby quilt and it's still pink and blue triangle somewhere. Oh my gosh. I sew <laughs> baby quilts for all my friends who have babies. I do the patchwork quilts. Those are so wonderful. But <laughs> So Piper, when you were creating Anne Lowe and you have the scene of, you know, she's five, she's creating her little silk flowers. She's eight. She's helping her mom. She's 12 and she starts to step into her own. And she says, well, I think if we did this sash differently for a client Mm -hmm. would actually narrow, you know, make her waist look smaller and give her better lines. So even at 12, a a child, Mm -hmm. she has this gift. So first of all, how, how do you know these specific scenes? Let's talk about your research. And then how did you bring Anne Lowe to life? I wanted to, as I said, looking at her as an artist, to really mm. think about her as a protege, which Ooh. I mean, 
wait, not a protege, sorry, prodigy, <laughs> thinking about her as a child who had a special kind of talent that you notice in other scenes that both her mother and her grandmother recognized as being extraordinary, even beyond their capabilities. So that's how I, I set up those early scenes, was thinking about how would uh, someone who was an artist express themselves in this way? This is sort of widely known um, amongst uh, the, the whole aspect of um, what, what we do know about Anne Lowe. There are certain, first of all, we, there are certain things we don't know about Anne Lowe, primarily because she was a Black woman born in Jim Crow, Alabama in 1898. We do know that. We do know uh, that her birthday actually is uh, this Wednesday, December 14th. We know that. But we don't have a birth certificate. So, you know, due to the whole aspects of the circumstances of her life, there are certain records and other things in terms of confirm confirming her life uh, that we don't have. But what we do know is that she did have this early insisted interest and in that she found expression early on when she was young, uh, creating or gathering up the fabrics that her mother and grandmother had discarded in these beautiful evening gowns to fashion into these flowers, which would become her signature um, as, uh, as, as a fashion designer. Um, so, you know, just sort of taking those aspects of her life that were known and sort of creating a story around them to say, why would she do certain things or how would she get from the flowers to something more substantial, um, et cetera, uh, were the things. And these were things that, that you do when you're writing, uh, what's known as biographical historical fiction about someone's life. It's sort of like you have these tent poles and you're constructing the connection between them, the facts or the tent poles um, in terms of that. But once, uh, if anything, the mystery of uh, one of the research pieces that I had long sought but didn't get before the book had been completed, which was um, the videotape of her appearing on this Mike Douglas talk show in 1964, um, where she she says that very thing, like, oh, I made my first dress when I was eight. Blah, blah, blah. You know, she's just <laughs> tossing this stuff out, you know, to say she was a prodigy. That's what she was. She was this, you know, um, excellent fashioner, this modest early on um, in her life. So it was good to, when I finally was able to watch that, have those things confirmed uh, as part of uh, as as part of her story, um, but yeah, in terms of research, uh, a very important um, thesis was written by a young woman who was a textile scholar by the name of Margaret Powell, uh, who was looking to write a comprehensive biography of her life, which is something that we still need as well as uh, to create uh, the fashion uh, exhibit, the exhibit, uh, which is what artists get uh, in terms of showcasing their art to bring together in you know, one place, the various dresses, et cetera, that she had um, created and to put them in it together and exhibit. Margaret uh, wrote the uh, thesis and filed it away. She graduated from the Corcoran School under the auspices of George Washington University, and I was able to obtain that. And some of her uh, transcripts that she had when she uh, took interviews from some of Anne's descendants um, in order to do certain kinds of research about it. But there were some like little serendipitous things like Ooh. Anne was born and grew up two counties away from my paternal great grandmother and that they were contemporaries so that I knew certain things about what her childhood probably looked like, uh, as well as the very famous Zora Neale Hurston, who, again, grew up not too far away and that I'm a Zora Neale Hurston scholar. So it was like the kind of thing where, like, I might have had a better handle on her young years, especially. Um, than somebody else might have. So those were like sort of serendipitous things that were like, wow, that was cool. Wow. <laughs> so your great grandmother grew up two counties over in Alabama, and then yeah. you grew up near 
near Zora Neale Hurston, where in the in the town in Florida where Zora Neale Hurston. Zora Neale Hurston was born in Knott's Gallicus, Alabama, actually. Okay, okay, I didn't mm-hmm. know. I yes. only where the yeah, everybody was thinks of Florida, 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 but she was actually born in Alabama. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, so you were okay. So you were born near her. No, you- I was born in Pittsburgh, but I'm a Zuna Hurston scholar. That was the, oh, the okay. area of study that I got you know, it. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Debbie says I enjoyed this book. Anne Lowe had been unknown to me until this book. Her personal and professional challenges certainly made for a fascinating story. As an aside, my mom was from Nebraska, so I immediately understood your first men- mentions of Axarben. Axar- Axarben, yes. <laughs> and I'm new to that. She said, "Please, you mm-hmm. explain that." Yes, thank you, Debbie, for that mention of Axarben. Uh, yeah, Anne was glad to get in on that. Um, money-making opportunity <laughs> uh, where they have an annual ball gala and they employed her as a designer for that one year. Okay. So the answer came... is an event. And... Yes. It's an event. Yeah. She's it's Nebraska spelled backwards. See. Okay. Perfect. So yes. <laughs> thank you. Well, I love that you hooked on to that and that that was yes. so- you. Oh, yes. thank you for sharing that. Yes, thank you, Debbie. And yes. saying this, and welcome to the conversation. Hello, Anne. Hi, Anne. <laughs> such a great story. Thank you for introducing us to Anne Lowe. Thank you for listening. Our fellow <laughs> Anne. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Um, Debbie says, being aware of JFK's selection of Abraham Bolton mm-hmm. as the first AA Secret Service agent on presidential detail, Jackie's choice of Lowe for her wedding dress stood out. Yeah. Well, you know, her choice, right? Was it her choice? And this is one of the things that's the ongoing aspect. Uh, and and in, in terms of depicting Jackie uh, as part of Anne's story, which really isn't until the latter third of the book um, that uh, she comes into uh, play there. She was a, um, her mother, Janet Auchincloss, was a, um, a client of Ann Lowe's um, and Ann Lowe designed her second wedding gown when um, her mother remarried to a very wealthy Hugh Auchincloss. Um, she designed the wedding outfit for that wedding. And she also designed uh, Jacqueline's Deb dress when she was Deb of 1947, Deb of the year, her sister's dress when she was Deb of the year four years later her half-sisters, her stepsisters. She had an ongoing relationship with the family uh, that goes far beyond whatever. When I would read Jacqueline biographies that would just say a seamstress made the dress or the family seamstress and not name Anne Lowe in the biography. So it was really very much about excavating who did that and restoring the appropriate title to her, a fashion designer, someone beyond a seamstress who was creating custom designs that were individual to each and every customer that she serviced. She designed for Roosevelt's, Vanderbilt's, DuPont's, most famously um, Marjorie Merriweather Post of the Post Fortune, um, she had an ongoing relationship with many wealthy customers uh, that are very famous in terms of uh, United States history. Now, Piper, you got a question. Margaret saying Deb of the Year of California's <laughs> over here going, what now? So yes. what, what, what is that? What's going on? They used to have a thing where, you know, you would, uh, I mean, you know, this is what it was. When you turned a certain age and you were ready for marriage to be on the marriage market, they would have a great big ball and uh, you would be presented to society, which was was to say, uh, here she is. She's ready to be married. (laughs) And you needed a big, floofy white gown for that occasion. But you wanted it to be it was always a white gown, but you wanted to be different in some way um yeah right so it's about not not it was like i think it was usually like by the second year of your college if you've ever heard of the alternate terms sometimes when people talk about coming out 
while we use while we now refer that to people who are talking that you be free to talk about their sexuality coming yeah. out meant bringing a young woman out into society to be ready to be married and then every year you know amongst all of these dead balls uh the people in the it probably was a political, very political process because it probably depended on who you knew and who you were connected to and all of that other kind of stuff. They would make a fuss about or a crown un, an unofficial Deb of the Year. And in 1947, the Deb of the Year was Jacqueline Bouvier. And how, okay, so, so many questions. Who decides mm-hmm. the Deb <laughs> of the Year? Like, mm-hmm. and how... I mean, and how do you decide when you're ready for the marriage market? Marriage market, also terrifying term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Wow. So you would make your presentation. I mean, just Margaret saying she's been comfortable being the spinster of the year. (laughs) I heard that. (laughs) Yeah, usually it would be, uh, I think, in the spring of your, you know, first or second year uh, out of high school, you'd be like 19 or 20 years old. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so and in and, and her time, in Jacqueline Bouvier's time, and most particularly because of the horrible marriage that her mother had made when Janet married Jackie's father, uh, Black Jack Bouvier, uh, <laughs> who was a terribly adulterous uh, <laughs> alcoholic, uh, didn't have enough money, really to support Jackie or her sister in the high class society ways yeah. that they should have been. Um, there's a part in the book where Jackie is, is in the off the rack section, looking at the off the rack dresses and Anne encounters her asking her, what are you doing here? Because <laughs> it's what people you- like me who make you the individual things right um and it was because when her parents had been divorced at that point her father was talking about throwing her a ball himself and she oh. didn't want anything too grand for that ball so yeah it was it was kind of a sad thing but the grand dress that she wore when she was crowned deb of the year was made by Ann Lowe. margaret saying it's fascinating to think that the stuff you know, mm-hmm. the coming out slash so presentation from the Victorian age survived mm-hmm. all the way into the 1950s. Yeah, it really didn't start falling apart until the 60s. Wow. Um, but, you know, I say Jackie's year was 1947. Her right. sister's year was 51. So they were still a little bit away from that. But the whole objective in that part of society was as, as brilliant as, as Jacqueline Bouvier was in so many ways. Um, as a writer. She was a very talented writer. She won a contest from uh, the French version, I think, of Vogue magazine around this time. Uh, And it required her to have uh, a year of uh, internship at the magazine or whatever. Um, I think she beat out like hundreds of people by writing an essay to win this kind of thing. But the main objective for her mother was to find a man who's going to be able to support you. And like I said, her mother learned that lesson the hard way because of her father. When she remarried, she made sure she remarried Hugh Auchincloss, who had pots of money, as they said back in those days. And one of the things that people come across in terms of talking about this book that people didn't know is that Jackie was engaged before Jack. So I didn't know that until Mm -hmm. I got to that scene in the book. Yes. She was engaged to John Houston. And uh, her mother did not, was not encouraging of the match because she knew that John Houston being a a mere stockbroker was not going to have the kind of money that Jackie would need to be supported. So even as Jackie was working, By the time she's 23, 24, she's working at a Washington newspaper. She went to cover uh, Queen Elizabeth's coronation, et cetera. Her objective was still to find the husband who was going to support her, which she 
had she actually accepted a ring from John Husted and he came to visit and was going back home and she gave him back his engagement ring because she had met John Kennedy. <laughs> it's like I'll see somebody better over here. Yeah. So, yeah. She's trading up. Trading yeah. up. She traded up and uh, married JFK. Uh, but what's instead. interesting is that her mom, you know, was so, um, you know, understandably traumatized by her marriage to Black Jack Duvier, a mm -hmm. consummate cheat and scoundrel and gambler and living beyond his means and yeah. not, I mean, not husband of the year material. And her whole goal was to marry her daughter, you know, marry Jackie off to someone who could support her. But then repeats this pattern of generational yeah, yeah, race exactly her off to someone who is a consummate chief same same as her father yeah <laughs> um so was, there was sort of a bitter irony there you know yes. i couldn't help thinking what if she had married the first guy and maybe you know how different would her life have been yeah not but even thought. notice when she remarried when she remarried uh aristotle onassis right money guy take care of you know she's still thinking in that same vein which Ann low notes in her internal monologue mm -hmm. is, yes she says we've all had to do that as women i had to do it my you know her, her mother had to do that even jackie kennedy onassis which she does not like anyone mm -hmm. to call her that onassis name right um she does you know she says even that um you know had to you know everyone has to do what they have to do we have a mystery user saying she did. Oh, and I think we're getting some interference on your microphone there, Piper. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, no worries. Um, someone's okay. saying, I didn't know about her previous engagement. Me neither. I didn't mm -hmm. know until I got to that part of the book. Was that widely known, Piper? Or was that kind I of guess not. I, 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 as a Jackie fan, I always knew. <laughs> I don't know. I've seen all the movies and all the stuff. And whenever you watch any of the movies, we're like, they always get some little uh, third or fourth tier dude to play John Houston and. The little scene when she slips his pocket, her ring, the ring into the pocket, and says, "Well, I'm sorry, but it's just not going to work out." Cut thing, okay. uh, because you know I met this dude at a dinner party, and he was pretty. You know, he had lots of hair and was hot. <laughs> lots of good, good hair. Good hair, yeah. Exactly. Weird Boston accent, but whatever. Right. <laughs> Readers gotta read. Hey girl, welcome to conversation. Hey, Always a pleasure you. to see your name pop thank up. You thank, for you. Coming. thank you for Yeah, so Anne me. had a long relationship with uh this family and uh like I said, knew these girls to the point where uh, you know, this was over decades. Um, and just not naming her. Um, and it was so interesting because when I was doing a signing in one place, someone said, you know, they probably just thought she was just some black woman making dresses. You know, they just didn't think of the the designing, the engineering that went into each garment. You know, her belief in terms of uh, building in the undergarments into the dress uh, and the line so that it would look a certain way and present itself. And as I said, this whole aspect of having this very feminine uh, kind of way of, you know, presenting a woman at this point, whether it's for uh, a ball or um, a wedding, et cetera, all of that. And um, the, the, the videotape of the Mike Douglas show uh, is online now. I, I knew where it was, but due to the pandemic and all of this, <laughs> I, I couldn't go to Philadelphia and be like, I know that tape is in here. <laughs> Let me in. <laughs> but they posted it and uh, it's very insightful in terms of, you know, uh, it's well, first of all, it's in black and white. So when they do have the fashion show that's part of it, you have to use your imagination. But what you see is still so stunning in terms of um, what she's able to pull off. Um, mm. Yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. So. Julie, welcome to the conversation. She'd like to know, Piper, how did you come up with the idea for the prologue? It really makes me want to read this book. Yeah, let's talk about that prologue. Hi, Julie. Um, I'm usually not a fan of prologues, so this was a very interesting thing that, yeah, I, you know, I was one of those writers who be like, prologue, no, you know, both. Well, you're everybody. Piper is also a, a professor of English literature. 
So we yes. got to listen to what she has to say. About- <laughs> well, see, then, you know, what always ends up happening is when I learn something, it's something that I've always repeatedly told my students. <laughs> so um, I'm nerd enough to have known that when I saw Tessa's tweet on Twitter, went to the Internet to read the article and look up the information on her and I saw her death date. And I'm nerd enough to know that instantly, without having Googled it, that that was the day after Charles and Diana got engaged. I already knew that. <laughs> wow. So I was like, oh. that, yeah, that's what put that into my head to say, oh, my goodness, if she were awake and conscious or whatever, and she had heard that Charles, because I, I was like, being, having been alive at that time, uh, I was young, but I was alive. So everybody was wondering, when is this dude going to get married? It really was like this pressurized kind of thing about oh, yeah. I char- yeah, it was a big thing about he's just running around with these women. And what, when is he going <laughs> to settle down? You know, so, uh, yeah. Um, and I said, the thing, and this was something that she really did. She chased other commissions after that. I said, oh. wonder, I said, that's the commission. That would have been the commission, right, of Prince Charles, whoever he was going to marry that wedding gown, um, and uh, her thoughts about it, and knowing that she was old, blind, and sickly, and probably was not going to get, not to chase that commission, let alone not see the commission. So um, that's what gave me the idea. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, she chased uh, the Johnson girls, uh, both when both the Johnson girls got married uh, in the 60s. Uh, that was she, the LBJ president. Yes, mm-hmm, both Linda and Lucy. She, she wrote letters and everything. She was always, you know, after that, because of the, uh, what had happened with uh, the Jackie Kennedy commission and um there's always sort of this little aftertaste with it that was kind of like the thing. even in the mike douglas interview if you watch it um she says i did what she wanted to do we could we consulted etc uh, but somebody else had some input too <laughs> in terms of the dress that that came out uh that's in the book and uh 100 you know what jackie would have wanted but it's interesting to think of her at that point and what I was thinking of uh, Jackie at that point as 24-year-old Jackie, not yet global icon Jackie, right, Ooh. kind of situation. So, um, Wow, thank you. And I love that you correlated it to Prince Charles and mm-hmm. Lady Diana Spencer's engagement, tying it into what is so present right now with Megan and yes. um, Harry's Netflix special exactly. and mm-hmm. um, uh, William and uh, Catherine, uh, Kate Middleton. Yeah, I know about all that stuff. See, as I said, because messy families, I love that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, that, is the, that is the, that is the, that is the, that is the siren's call for you, Piper. Yes, it is. It really is. <laughs> uh, Linda, welcome to the conversation saying, Hi, hey, Linda certainly made her way up in the world she sure did and yes. she goes on to say dressmaking is an art for sure not for her not for yeah. Lena. yeah, yeah. It, it she really did when you think about um where she came from yeah and I, I like to say that the book is really a reflection of if somebody has a dream mm. the length to which they're willing to go to achieve their dream I, that's why I say it's really a book for everyone as I say it's because it's from the viewpoint of this rather singular I think rather singular black woman genius who really ought to be restored to history should be talked about at least every February and March if not beyond that um <laughs> to say that uh if you have a dream that you know you can achieve it so yes yes because I think I mean, this is just a fact. I love what you said, but this is a book that shows what can happen when you have a dream. Anne Lowe literally triumphing over the most humble circumstances in rural Alabama, mm-hmm. um, but with her t- incredible God-given genius, her talent mm-hmm. rising to 
design hot couture for the most fabulous, famous, beautiful women of the world. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's and it's amazing that Tyne's dust has has buried her and, yeah. and only now is she with your work is she coming out to receive the accolades and the honor that she de so richly deserves um so i like that idea and i want to see her continue to shine in february yeah. for black history month women march for for women's history month I say, at least february and march let's get a poster and for her you know at least then <laughs> You should be honored in the presidential library and the Kennedy Absolutely. library. Yeah, exactly. She, that's where the dress is. It's not on display, but that's where the, the dress is kept. And they put a paper duplicate. Um, but as as I think is part of the, the, res, the result of Margaret Powell's hard uh, work prior to her passing away, uh, she passed away, sadly enough, at 38 of um, breast cancer. Oh, um, God. Yeah, so she never got to finish, you know, this work that she was oh. doing. Her, you know, goal of having the exhibit and the biography. Um, the exhibit's going to happen next year uh, in September as part of commemorating the 70th wedding anniversary of uh, Jack and Jackie. And these fashion design students are recreating the dress. And there's going to be 40 and low gowns on display between September and January. So where's, people, where's that going to be? Wichester in Delaware outside of Philadelphia. Okay. okay. So, yeah. There are some people who are like making little trips and stuff. And so I, I probably need to get on if I want to do a little trip or something like that. Um, come on up. Come on up. Oh, yes. Oh, no. I'll oh, be yeah. there. I, I am going. I am going. Oh, um, so, yeah. <laughs> Anne saying, I immediately went to try to find pictures of the wedding gown. Are there other photos of Anne's work available? So, yeah, so I posted two of my favorite. One, because I wanted to see Anne actually working on the dress. Mm -hmm. And one of the dress itself, where you can see her attention to detail, everything the Piper's been saying, the lines, the pleats, her love of flowers, the, the all that handwork. Where can people find more Piper? Yeah, it's it's pretty much as you just Google. Um, there are many examples that pop up under like the Google Images tab. Uh, sort of the the ones that uh, I talk about more in the book, of course, are Jackie Kennedy's wedding gown, as well as Olivia de Havilland's gown, um, which her other most famous commission, Olivia de Havilland, who I guess is best known to people uh, as playing Melanie in Gone with the Wind. Uh, but several years after that, uh, won the Academy Award for Best Actress. And her, you know, how it is when you go to the Oscars back then, it's the same thing. People would, you know, show their fashions. And then it would be said, you know, who designed this dress? Not this time. Uh, the person whose name was revealed was Sonia, who was actually Ann Lowe's boss. Um, so Anne Lowe did not get credit for what is clearly Anne Lowe design. And instead of the fabric flowers uh, in the Olivia de Havilland dress, if you Google that, Olivia de Havilland Oscar winning dress, uh, she hand painted that floral design that comes across from the bust to the floor. I know, I just, I marvel at wow. that. I'm like, she's like, and you know, it's like, it's not a stencil. She hand painted that onto the gown wow. and it's an earlier example of a strapless gown which i think put strapless gowns into the zeitgeist of the late 40s and the early 50s um looking oh, at fashion God. history julie saying wow you have such a good memory for dates thank you for the great answer julie thanks oh, for the great welcome. question i'm a professor nerd that's what i do <laughs> Oh, great question. What was Anne Lowe's own personal style? Her own personal style was to not be obtrusive. Um, she was known for wearing black and uh, the little black dress, uh, which she had in many styles and, and forms. Uh, she wore hats because her hair was very thin. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that that was what she would wear whenever she was with clients um, and consulting. And, you know, if you look at the Mike Douglas show tape, that's what she has on. 
um, which for this, trying to put together a cover, um, which is an important thing. Yeah, is, yeah, exactly. So to center her, right, always was a difficulty because in a lot of the photographs of her, she's not centered, right? She's off center. She's off working like the one you posted, Sarah. Mm -hmm. She's working on someone. And I, I kind of insisted that in this case, I wanted her to be centered. Uh, and it took nine go rounds to get um, and another really cool um, detail about this book is that um, I'm going to hold it really close. It says yeah. by her own design and that look, and it actually is raised. Isn't that so cool? It, yeah. It's that was a cool little detail. So right. it looks like a, um, a, a clothing a label. Book. Yeah. And everybody knows in those fashion, like the label is everything. The so it was really everything. cool. Yeah. <laughs> it was but really cool texture. It feels, it feels like embroidery. And so that just makes yeah. it extra special. Just yeah, I just I was I, it wasn't not having I hadn't even thought of. I was just like, can we just? I was like, can we just put Anne in the middle of the cover? I don't know. Uh, but they finally figured it out. So. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm glad that they centered her. I'm glad that you fought for that. Yeah. Um, we just got to read. Thank you for that fabulous question. Anne saying yes. this is fascinating. Thank you, You're Linda. Welcome. Saying such great details about Anne. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for the great questions, the great comments. Y'all, yeah. um, the book is out now and you can grab your copy right here from our favorite woman owned independent bookstore, Murder by the Book. So put your order in and support woman owned independent bookstores. And the good folks at Murder by the Book will ship it out to you tomorrow. So no matter where you're watching from, here is the link. Click, 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 order, order, order. And you too will want to get your hands on this book and on Anne's story. Um, readers, you've got to read saying thank you. Thank, thank you. you. You've got to read. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, well, Professor Piper Hughley, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all of this delicious information. Julie saying, I think this is going to be my full price buy for the year. Yay. Thank you. I hope you enjoy it, Julie. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Piper, what a pleasure to host you. And thank you for sharing. I mean, what beautiful work to tell this story of this woman, this incredible protege, this talent, this of a lifetime, of a gener of a generation, of a century, um, and to bring her forward and to honor her memory and her work. Thank um, you. It's so special. So thank you for coming on and sharing with us. Um, y'all, thank you for joining us. Thank you for all your fabulous questions. And um, and and Piper, come write a mystery, will you? And come back and talk to us about that. I, yeah, I I want. I'm I'm intrigued now. So <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, Margaret says she was surprised to see the great Piper Hughley on Sarah Develo's <laughs> panel. Hey, Margaret. I made I gotta, it. Yay. Hey, Margaret. I gotta keep you on your toes, right? You just That's never. Right. I, <laughs> can't that you know that I'm that I'm predictable or something. I got to keep y'all on your toes. Um, a double delay. That's very kind, Margaret. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, y'all have a great rest of your Monday. Have a great week ahead, and I will see you next time right here on Mystery Thriller Raven. Take care, y'all.